Hello, IHI community, and welcome to the final keynote address of this year's IHI Forum. As usual, we've saved the best for last. Before I introduce your speaker, I wanted to introduce myself. Since I'm a bit new at IHI and the pandemic has prevented me from getting to know as many of you as I would like, my name is Cynthia Bargainer, and since the early part of 2021, I've been serving as IHI's Chief Operating Officer. As my colleagues have heard me say many times, I've been a fan of IHI for many years. This is one of the many reasons why joining IHI's executive leadership team earlier this year was such a joy. It's not often that you get the chance to join an organization you've greatly admired from afar. Another reason for joy is that I get to closely collaborate with all of you, an extraordinary community of people who share my passions for health, improvement, and equity. I'll try to keep this introduction brief, as the person I'm introducing to you is the proverbial person who needs no introduction. It's hard to think of anyone more deserving of that description than Don Berwick. It's been more than a decade since Don stepped down as IHI's first CEO to run Medicare and Medicaid under President Obama. And since his appointment at CMS ended in 2012, IHI has benefited tremendously from continued and close engagement with Don. He participates in and advises on a number of projects and initiatives, including a pivotal leadership role in IHI's Leadership Alliance, our network of committed and visionary leaders determined to realize the full potential of the IHI Triple Aim. In recent years, Don has been an invaluable voice and support on the IHI Board of Directors as well. Many people have referred to Don as the conscience of healthcare, a description that I imagine makes Don a bit uncomfortable, but I don't think it's off the mark. Even in the early days of IHI, when Don was demonstrating and promoting the technical power of improvement science to transform how healthcare is delivered, he was driven by the why. For Don, improving care delivery in the service of better health was a moral responsibility for us in the healthcare. His eloquence in making the case that improvement was the right thing to do, even in a hospital was all, that was already performing well, has compelled millions to take up the charge. I'm sure many of you watching today were inspired by Don at some point, as was I. In the 30 years since Don founded IHI, the circumstances of your work has changed. They've changed dramatically even in the past two years. Yet at the heart of all our work still lies the same why that motivated and animated Don a generation ago. We are society's healers, the stewards of health. This responsibility now compels us to look at every aspect of how we work and what we work on. The promise of quality improvement has been realized inequitably, and our health systems still draw too many resources from other parts of the society that are even more essential to good health than quality care. Our responsibilities to our patients, to our workforce, and to our societies has never been more urgent than it is today. And I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling grateful to Don for keeping us all looking and moving forward. Before I turn you over to Don, I want to take a moment to thank and recognize the Peterson Center on Healthcare for their generous support of this keynote presentation and their unwavering commitment to making higher quality, more affordable health care a reality. Now, please join me in welcoming your final 2021 IHI Forum keynote speaker, the incomparable Don Berwick.
Thank you, uh, Cynthia, for that kind introduction. And let me add my thanks to the Peterson uh, Center on Healthcare. I appreciate your support. Uh, it's so nice to be with everybody again, uh, even virtually. Uh, the IHI Forum is the highlight of my year every year. And the opportunity to speak with you all is uh, an enormous privilege. Of course, I can't wait till we're, we're back together in person. Uh, that's always even more festive and even more a highlight of my year. But thank you all for joining me this way. So overwhelmed, that's a word we hear a lot in these uh, pandemic times. Doctors, nurses, hospitals overwhelmed by patient surges. Uh, parents overwhelmed by trying to balance their kids' needs and their own needs. Uh, Zoom meetings head to tail and endless day after day after day. Uh, political processes and government overwhelmed by rancor and divisiveness. Uh, if you're poor or marginalized, double that, triple it. Uh, overwhelmed by risks, by scientific messages that seem to change daily, mandates, job insecurity. And then there are other overwhelming forces way beyond the COVID virus. It's hard to put them into a single category. Maybe let's call them social forces or societal forces. It's a landscape of human problems that have been with us a long time, but that somehow seem at a crescendo in, in recent years. Those social forces are not a short list, but, but here's some of them. Racism, soaring inequity, violent civil conflicts, threats from non-state actors, opioids, persistent hunger and homelessness in America and elsewhere, assaults on democratic processes, extinction of species, and then there's the alpha problem, climate change. So what's a person supposed to do? Just when you may glimpse a little daylight, maybe the kids are at last back in school or the COVID case counts are falling, just when you drop your guard a little and take a deep breath, you pick up the paper and you get hit in the jaw. Is COP26 a failure? Does Dr. Fauci see a COVID surge ahead? Is Congress paralyzed still? Uh, a standoff in Boston Common between libertarians who will be damned if the government's going to make them get vaccinated and progressive activists who will be damned if vaccine resistors will be allowed to keep this pandemic going. What is a person supposed to do? And moreover, what's an organization supposed to do? In particular, a healthcare organization. What's a hospital board or a CEO or CMO supposed to do as demand after demand after demand slam against the gates like, like a battering ram carried by the crises of our times? I mean, look at your mission statement, dedicated to the health of our community, right, or something like that. What if that health depends on much, much more than traditional medic medical care, much, much more than the stuff we're being paid to do? We, we could take just a narrow view of the causes of illness. Our list would be a list like this, bacteria, viruses, genetic abnormalities, aging, uh, carcinogens, accidents. But that's not the list of the true root causes of health and illness. I showed that list of root causes in, in recent prior forum plenary speeches, uh, such as the list that I drew from the towering summary by Sir Michael Marmot in his amazing 2015 book, The Health Gap. To remind you, Sir Michael there lists five sets of causes of health, illness, and the variations in health and illness, the causes of inequity, five of what we today call social determinants of health, or social influences on health, early childhood stresses, education systems, workplace conditions, supports for aging, and community infrastructures like housing and transportation, recreational opportunities, food security, violence, criminal justice systems, and environmental exposures. And then Sir Michael adds a sixth social determinant. He calls it fairness, you remember. It's the cultural or sociological norm of solidarity, unity, a sense of mutual caring, mutual responsibility. Marmot calls, it, call, calls fairness the cause of the causes. Differences in fairness, he thinks, are the underlying reasons why health, why health itself improves or worsens or differs among and within nations. The, the battering ram of overwhelming demand 
comes largely in those domains, the pattering ram of social determinants. The pandemic, which is narrowly speaking just a virus, interacts strongly with those social factors, poverty, racism, class distinctions, political division. And that's why African-Americans have died of COVID in the United States at more than twice the rate of white Americans. That's why while 71% of Americans have had at least one vaccine dose, only 6% of Africans have. In many nations, it's fewer than 2%. That's not a virus, that's inequality. Are you feeling overwhelmed? I mean, it's hard even to stare at that list, the, the list of true causes of health and illness, let alone trying to solve it. I know that. I'm tired too. But an analogy keeps occurring to me for what it's worth. When someone's heart stops, a cardiac arrest, a clock starts ticking toward brain injury and then brain death. Nature sets the tempo. The brain without oxygen begins to deteriorate irreversibly about three minutes after its oxygen supply disappears. Uh, hospitals have code blue teams and they're ready to respond to cardiac arrests rapidly. They have staff trained and certified to initiate cardiopulmonary resuscitation, basic cardiac life support, advanced cardiac life support immediately. Why? Well, because nature made a rule. It's the three minute rule about brain death. And because hospitals are supposed to try to save lives, they obey the rule. Imagine a hospital that said, well, we, don't, we, we can't accept that rule. We're, we're too busy. We have lots of other stuff to do. We don't get paid enough to get to the cardiac arrest patient in three minutes. So we're going to extend our response time. Here, it's going to be 10 minutes. Or imagine a doctor uh, during the cardiac arrest who says, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I can deal with the airway, but I, I don't have time to support circulation. Well, no hospital, you may not do that. No doctor, that's malpractice. That's dereliction of duty. You don't get to repeal nature's law, you obey it. In fact, nature has lots of laws that as a hospital or a healer, you have to obey. Nature says germs cause infections. It's nature's law. Your duty is to stop infections. Wash your hands, clean your tools, give your antibiotics on time. You may not say you're too busy to do that. Nature says sepsis can be insidious. That's nature's law. Your duty is to remain vigilant for sepsis and to treat it promptly. You may not say that you're too busy to do that. So now we hear the battering ram of social influences on health. Those influences are natural laws as well. They're maybe not as dramatic and as definitive as the three minute rule about oxygen and brain death. Maybe there are laws that play out over longer time frames with, with subtler causal chains, but they're laws nonetheless. Chronically hungry people are sicker than those well fed. It's a law. Children with toxic stress in early life become adults with double the burden of chronic illness or more. That's nature's rule. Lonely elders die sooner, much sooner than those who are accompanied. Nature rules that poverty breeds disease as certainly as disease breeds poverty, uh, that despair breeds death, that inequity breeds death. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Well, the question is what nonetheless is your duty? Some line got drawn, some line about what health seeking work we in healthcare can be excused from and where no excuse can ring true. Where's that line? I believe ever more strongly, the better that I understand what truly makes us ill or well, that we have drawn that line incorrectly in American healthcare. And that as a consequence, we are a far unhealthier nation than we can be and we should be. I'm arguing for a big change in our concept of the role of the American healthcare system in general and of the role of the American hospital in particular. I admit, of course, that I'm doing that at, in some ways, the worst possible time in the midst of the pandemic, with un unprecedented professional burnout, with political fragmentation. Any hospital executive or board member or clinician would have a strong basis for calling me unrealistic or crazy or worse. But please hear me out. I, I began my pitch, my crazy pitch, two years ago when I set out the framework for what I called the moral determinants of health. That began with my 
2019 National Forum speech, the, the last one in person before we went virtual. And I followed up with a viewpoint essay of the same name in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, in June of 2020. My argument then and now is that the moral foundations of the healing professions should push us logically toward direct engagement with the social influences on health. I listed seven suggested targets, areas of engagement. Healthcare, I said, needs to become an active agent of change in, first, supporting the human rights conventions of the United Nations, in essence, declaring fairness as a determinant of health, the cause of the causes. Second, assuring healthcare as a universal human right in the United States, instead of leaving still 30 million people out in the cold and at least another 70 or 80 million without sound healthcare coverage. Third, supporting U.S. leadership in addressing climate change, which, by the way, the World Health Organization has now declared to be the most significant threat to human health on the planet. Fourth, supporting compassionate American immigration policy reform instead of leaving millions of people in limbo uh, or worse. A fifth, uh, reforming the criminal justice system, assuring a restorative, healing, and effective system instead of an abusive, racist, and ineffective one, which is in general the one we have now. A sixth, ending hunger and homelessness in our nation, totally preventable scourges in any wealthy nation, and certainly in the U.S., where, by the way, 40% of our food is wasted. And finally, seventh, assuring voting rights and the integrity of dem democratic institutions. This is foundational to fairness and equity, and these are being undermined as we speak in large parts of our country. In that speech, I called for solidarity among healthcare organizations and professionals in the pursuit of that agenda as a campaign for the moral determinants of health owned and activated by healthcare organizations and professionals. Now, reactions to my proposal have been interesting and they've been mixed. On the one hand, almost every one of the many audiences to whom I've made this case in the two years since that forum speech has applauded, they've welcomed the message, in many cases very, very warmly. Standing ovations are not unusual. Messages of gratitude to me for calling it like it is, and of course that makes me, that makes me feel great. But a closer look is much more humbling. The words are generally of praise, but the faces are less certain. I see furrowed brows and, and narrowed eyes. Often my host, say a hospital CEO, or an association executive will thank me for that provocative speech without being totally clear about what exactly my provocation provoked. Discussions that follow tend to mention how important it is not to try to boil the ocean, uh, the importance of focus, maybe some warning about medicalizing social problems. Some will say, well, we're already doing it. Uh, hospitals talk about the help they're giving to food pantries or respite housing, or maybe language translation services for their patients. They talk about community partnerships and diversity, equity, and inclusion training for their staff. In one case, my speech bombed. That was in my annual January class for Harvard medical students and Harvard dental students, where two years in a row, 2020 and 2021, my talk on moral determinants of health met with total silence in rooms of medical students and dental students who are usually quite verbal, uh, to say the least. I finally asked the students, why? Why did my lecture bomb? And their answer was crisp and it was clear. They said, because we already know most of what you're telling us. We read the newspapers. We have classes on epidemiology and social medicine. We get it. Healthcare does not create health. We understand that. But what are we supposed to do about that? Don't just tell us the problem again. Uh, tell us the solution. So fair enough. That's what I'll do today. But before my prescription, I want to do one more bit of exploration, diagnosis. Do you think healthcare in general, and hospitals in particular, legitimately can claim that they cannot or should not forcefully address these social influences on health as a core component of their work? Can they, can they legitimately claim a bystander seat? 
Many, I think, will want to. Their case will be forceful, that they lack the expertise to solve social problems, that their main job, giving care to the sick, is massive enough by itself, especially in the pandemic, that it exhausts the resources, that their staffs are burned out, that their margins are thin or negative, that no one pays them to solve social problems, that uh, their, their activity in this sphere would reflect unwise medicalization of social problems, and that, that many social problems have political roots and that healthcare organizations shouldn't get political. So, so I understand those arguments, of course, I sympathize. But with those who use these arguments, these circumstances as excuses for non-engagement with social influences on health, I just do not agree. And just to be clear, by engagement, I mean a lot more than a community benefits program or a series of uh, small good-hearted projects or an office in the annex or uh, a few pages in the annual report. I mean a central, daily, strategic focus of the hospital's board, senior management, leadership structures, finance, and accountability systems on the creation of health. I mean a considerable redesign of the business model of the hospital and indeed of the entire American healthcare system. Why? Because healthcare is too big for our nation to successfully pursue health without it. Healthcare takes too much from the common pool of resources to get a free pass. Healthcare in America garners to itself 18% of the gross domestic product. It grows at a multiple of the general rate of inflation. It takes what it wants, and it generally gets what it asks for. Healthcare expects the public and the public treasury to defer to it in a way that no other industry, except maybe national defense, dares to expect. Look, healthcare is a noble enterprise, no question about that. But it is a noble enterprise with the power and the habit and the history of confiscation. And it is time for healthcare to see itself as a massive influence and a massively distorting influence on the ability of public and private stakeholders to devote time and money to the things that make us ill and render us healthy. Without change in its strategy, healthcare in America is not just largely irrelevant to the pursuit of health, it is an impediment to the pursuit of health. So what, what do I recommend? 10 teams. I challenge every single hospital in America and every integrated health system to establish 10 teams, starting now, to reverse the flow of resources, which is now away from health determinants toward health determinants. Each team should have a senior sponsor from the ranks of the highest executive levels of leadership in the organization and it should have a board sponsor from the ranks of the trustees. Each team should have a generous budget, a designated leader, a regular reporting relationship at least weekly to the senior executive group, visibility in every board meeting, ambitious quantitative goals, and total transparency to the organization and to the community. Each team should have resources and encouragement to look far beyond the hospital's walls and far beyond the local region for best practice examples. It should have a license to visit in person and virtually any outside organization that can offer ideas and guidance, including organizations outside the United States. When possible, each team should be an active member of relevant learning collaboratives at the regional, national, and international scale. So here are the 10 teams I suggest as the, as the standards set. Uh, I'll suggest a very short charter for each team. And in most cases, I'll provide two resources, uh, the name of one or more experts or adv advocacy organizations in that area who, whom I would nominate as national coaches for the subject matter area, and then the name of one or more healthcare organizations who are already accomplished exemplars of progress on that topic. There's going to be quite a detail, quite a bit of detail in this. Uh, 
I assure you that slides and the video of this speech will be available after the forum, and so you don't need to keep copious notes now if you don't wish to. Team one, healthcare coverage. Its aim is to achieve universal healthcare insurance coverage for the region served by the hospital. This would have both programmatic components to ensure the enrollment of eligible people and political components to obtain Medicaid expansion in non-expansion states. Our country has 30 million uninsured people still, and maybe, as I said, 70 to 80 million minimum with bad insurance. If you want to coach for this, you could contact Healthcare for All or seek out Ron Pollack, who was the founder of Families USA and of, en of Enroll America, which is an exemplar. Enroll America was started in 2010 and at the dawn of the Affordable Care Act, and it reached everywhere in the United States to enroll people newly eligible under the ACA. Dramatically successful in engaging the activities of many, many healthcare organizations and associations during its peak time. It is time to restart Enroll America and for all healthcare organizations to get involved with getting everybody enrolled that possibly could be. I point out, by the way, that if the Build, Build Back Better bill that's now in Congress passes, it may well include significant resources to get health coverage to the 4 million people currently cut out in the 12 non-expansion states in the United States. It's our job in healthcare to see that Medicare expansion is completed. Uh, that should be part of Team One's assignment. We need to get that job done. As another exemplar, let me also highlight the work of the University of South Florida in their program, Florida Cover Covering Kids and Families, taking local responsibility for assuring all possible health care coverage uh, for uh, people in that state. Team two, focused on food security. Team food security, the aim, end hunger, and food insecurity in the region served by your hospital or healthcare system. Hunger has no place in the America that we want, no place in the America we should tolerate. And by the way, remember, we waste 40% of the food produced in our country. This is not a supply problem. If you want to coach, I'd recommend, among others, Kate Sommerfeld at ProMedica's Social Determinants of Health Institute. ProMedica itself, the healthcare organization in Toledo, Ohio, with Randy Ustra as CEO is a, is a wonderful exemplar. ProMedica has centered food security in its strategic sites, reaching tens of thousands of people with food security. And its National Social Determinants of Health Institute, by the way, extends ProMedica's investments and involvement in addressing exactly the social influences on health that I'm talking about. It can be done. Team three, housing security. The aim here would be to end chronic homelessness in the region served by your hospital or your healthcare system. No one person in America should be without a stable home. And by the way, in no one community in America are the numbers of people needing housing overwhelming. This problem is totally solvable to zero. Among your best coaches would be the, the incredible Roseanne Haggerty and her organization, Community Solutions, which has won the $100 million investment from the MacArthur Foundation this year uh, to support its work aiming for zero homelessness in communities around the United States. As an exemplar, that is it. Join the Built for Zero movement. 98 communities currently participate in Built for Zero. Kaiser Permanente, Common Spirit, Providence St. Joseph, UC Davis, and Sutter have all pledged to create real-time data sharing agreements with local homelessness efforts across their systems as the first and most critical step to collaborating to end chronic homelessness in the populations that they serve. Join that movement, Team 3, that's your assignment. Team 4, meeting the needs of immigrants, whether documented or not. Uh, its aim is to assure excellent care and social support for all immigrants in the United States. 150,000 unaccompanied children entered the United States last year. That's the largest number in history. And we have increasing concern about the conditions and access of immigrant populations to the health care they need. For help 
coaches, you can turn to the incredible Dr. Paul Wise at Stanford University, who may be the national thought leader in this field. Uh, Marsha Griffin at the University of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, or Karen Mountain with the Migrant Clinicians Network, all experts who can help you understand the nature of programs to reach these, uh, these populations. For an exemplar, I recommend University of Texas Southwestern Parkland Hospital in Dallas, where the CEO, Dr. Fred Cerise and his colleagues have really extended uh, uh, much improved healthcare to both documented and undocumented people in that region for both chronic illness care, for prevention, and for public health. And please study and learn about the resources available and activities of the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. This is a population amidst us that needs your help, Team 4. Team 5 addresses corrections and prison health, uh, a team focused on restorative justice and health for incarcerated people. The aim is to create a criminal justice system focused on restoration, healing, compassion, and reentry. We have in America a more people per capita incarcerated than in any other nation on earth, at least any other developed nation. 2.3 million people in prisons, 10 million people a year cycling through jails, 70% of them have mental health or substance misuse problems. This is a health problem, it's a national embarrassment, and healthcare should stop it. We need a healing and restorative criminal justice system. Among the coaches I've met and commend to you would be Emily Wang, Wang at uh, Yale University. She's head of the Health Justice Lab and one of the great leaders and spokespeople for this agenda. Um, Emily is starting, by the way, a network of organizations focused on the best possible health care for incarcerated people who show up in your health care facility. I suggest you be in touch with her. Among exemplars, you could turn to Johns Hopkins uh, Medical System with a highly successful program to employ ex-offenders. This is to show both the, the safety and the, the uh, excellent performance of ex-offenders employed in that system. And I strongly recommend you're studying and joining the Transitions Clinic Network. This is providing health care and health-related employment trajectories for returning citizens, people leaving incarceration. Join the Transitions Clinic Network. Team six focused on climate, climate and health, and decarbonization. Its initial aim should be a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 from your organization, in line with goals now set by the Biden administration, and 100% uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, at least by 2050. The healthcare industry is responsible for 8.5% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. We can end that. We should end that. As I said before, the World Health Organization has now claimed that climate change is the number one threat to health on the planet. We must engage. Coaches are many. You can get engaged with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Healthcare Decarbonization Action Collaborative, which is just kicking off and will provide the leadership of the National Academy of Medicine for this effort, facility by facility. Please study and join the work of Healthcare Without Harm, the pioneering organization in this field. You might want to get to know Professor Jody Sherman at Yale University, whose own personal work on uh, planetary health and uh, health, uh, decarbonization of healthcare is second to none. And please get to know uh, Jeff Thompson, friend, faculty member of IHI, former chief executive of Gunderson Health System, who over a decade ago uh, aimed for and reached zero in carbon. Exemplars would include Kaiser Permanente, which is thrillingly become now in 2020 the first carbon neutral large healthcare system in America. If Kaiser Permanente can do it, we all can. And then study Gunderson Health, Jeff Thompson's work. Way back in 2008, Gunderson Health System made a commitment to the health and well-being of the community by promising to reduce pollution in order to improve health and decrease its carbon footprint. And to do that in a way that lowers the cost of care and improves the local economy. Gunderson has become 56% more energy efficient and installed every form of renewable energy solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, landfill gas, anaerobic digestion, supporting community health, growing the local economy. 
Gunderson first produced more energy than it used, produced more energy than it used in October 2014. The health system saves $3 million a year from energy efficiency improvement. Uh, team six on climate and decarbonization, you have plenty of examples to join, join from, to, to, to learn from, and executives uh, support them. Team seven focused on voting rights. The aim is to protect voting rights for all. Assure 100% voting for staff, including clinical staff, and support patients who are inpatients during elections to vote. There are 50 million unregistered voters in the United States, by the way. That's equal to the entire population of Spain, unregistered in our country. Your coaches could include uh, organizations that, that were very active during the, the 2020 election, Vote Health, uh, which is now becoming Civic Health Alliance, and one of its leaders, uh, IHI faculty member Saranya Lehrer would be a great coach. And you might want to study Vote ER, an amazing organization of national scale, started, I think, initially by Dr. Alistair Martin, but many others involved now, working through emergency departments throughout the country to enroll people. Um, an exemplar organization in this field would be Altamed, an uh, amazing organization in Los Angeles, which is working through its community health centers to get people enrolled and voting. Uh, team eight, supporting education, strengthening elementary and secondary education in the regions served by your hospital or healthcare system. Among the coaches will be IHI's own program called Pathways to Population Health. I urge you to get to study it. The materials are on the IHI's website, well worth your getting connected with. And let me call out Rush Medical Centers, Rush Medical's Education and Career Hub, REACH, R-E-A-C-H. Exemplars include, uh, for example, the Mariposa Mobile Health Unit of uh, Camarena Health, which is bringing care directly to school campuses, and Rush's REACH program, that med uh, medical education and career hub. Uh, and then let me again call out Kaiser Permanente, which tends to lead in a lot of these fields. They have a thriving schools partnership that uh, one should study and learn from. Team nine would focus on early childhood supports, one of the most powerful social influences on health, what happens to kids when they're very young. The aim is to assure safe birthing, early childhood supports, and school readiness for kids under five in the region that's served by your hospital and healthcare system. Here you have coaches like uh, Dr. Uma Kodigal, uh, a giant of a leader in American healthcare for early childhood in her, from her work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, and I'll recommend that you track down Roz Gray. Roz was one of the founding leaders of Scotland's program called the Early Years Collaborative, which focused on the well-being of children under three in Scotland for safe birthing, bonding, and school readiness. And back to Uma Kodigal's leadership, the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center is now a terrific exemplar. Uh, it has its All Children Thrive program is addressing the needs of 66,000 children in the Cincinnati community in complete partnership and cooperation with community facilities and agencies. And here again, Kaiser Permanente, pioneering, partnering in Hayward, California, with a program called the Primary School Program, exemplars for Team 9. Team 10, focused on elderly, the aged, and loneliness. Its aim is to end social isolation for elders in the region served by your hospital or healthcare system. Here you have an abundance of wonderful coaches. I'll name uh, the amazing Terry Fulmer, uh, CEO of the John A. Hartford Foundation, who's devoted her career and the work of the Hartford Foundation to the well being of aged people. Uh, Dr. Sachin Jain, who has been a national spokesperson for working on loneliness and his positions at, at both Caremore and SCAN. Uh, you might take a look at Surgeon General Vivek Murthy's book, which has focused on togetherness and loneliness as an area of focus for well-being. And then an interesting book from Mark Friedman, the head of Encore, uh, a book about, it's called How to Live Forever, focused on intergenerational relationships, which is an area you can invest in to help relieve loneliness. For exemplars, you can study the work that Such and Jane uh, began at Caremore and now SCAN. SCAN has a chief togetherness officer, so could you. Let me mention a fascinating startup company called Papa Pal, which is linking student volunteers with isolated older people. You can contact them and see if you could get involved. And I'll uh, tip my hat to Rush again, where its social connections program is working on this, this uh, a challenge of 
linking elders to communities and accompaniment. Now, I would never claim that these 10 topics are right for every setting and every organization. Although, frankly, I suspect they apply well to most. Uh, you might want to join the 10 teams movement and swap out a topic or two, or heaven forbid, add a few. That would be exciting. I should mention Northwell Health in New York, by the way, where CEO Mike Dowling has launched a national initiative with Northwell's leadership to reduce gun violence. Maybe that should be Team 11. No matter what, I'd like to see everyone take on the whole portfolio. Focus, I have always thought, is overrated. When there's a job to do, you don't focus on fragments of the job. You do the whole job. That's excellence. We have so little time to waste. But if you absolutely demand an on-ramp that's more gradual, then here's one idea. One team per $100 million. Every healthcare organization should establish or re-energize one team of these 10 for every $100 million of revenue. If you're $500 million of revenue, five teams. And at $1 billion of annual revenue, you do all 10. However you start, start. Move improvement of the influences on health into the center of the strategic plan of your healthcare organization. Make it not your donation, make it your business. Is that impossible? I like the quote that I think is attributed to Muhammad Ali. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. I think I found that quote first in this jaw-dropping book by Colin O'Brady. Uh, Colin was the first person to cross Antarctica on foot, totally unassisted. At age 22, O'Brady was severely injured in a fire, and he was told he would never walk normally again. 22 months later, he won the Chicago Triathlon. He beat 4,000 other contestants. He went on to dozens more triathlons. He climbed the highest mountain on every continent in, within a four-month period. And he then walked 932 miles across Antarctica alone, pulling a sled of supplies that at the start weighed 375 pounds. I wonder what Colin O'Brady would say to a hospital executive who felt too busy to work on the determinants of health. Are you worried about burnout? I'll tell you what, I think 10 teams will reduce burnout. I think that offering the good people who work with you and for you a chance as part of their daily work to become meaningfully engaged in an organizationally supported team to improve life conditions and social justice for people in the communities you serve and in which they live would be oxygen. Uh, scholars who study work life and stress time and again reach the same finding that almost nothing contributes more to morale, resilience, and joy in work than the feeling of connection to meaning feeling that your work is a chance to improve the world or even the condition of a single person in ways that add meaning to your life. If you want to feel less overwhelmed, do something that lets you feel effective in helping others. Do you, do you fear scarcity? Then find the abundance in the goodwill and the dreams of those around you. As my friend Joe McCannon said, you have no idea how much people are waiting to be invited to do something great. Rebecca Solnit, in her remarkable book, A Paradise Built in Hell, tells the story of civil society response to five major disasters, like the San Francisco earthquake and the fire, of 19, and the fire in San Francisco of 1906, the Halifax Harbor explosion, and Hurricane Katrina. She finds countless examples of generosity, resilience, initiative, a communitarian spirit arising from the flames and from the loss. Uh, she writes, only a dispersed force of countless people making countless decisions is adequate to a major crisis. She posits that so powerful is this force that it threatens the elites and the entrenched structures of power. She finds the resilience and generosity of those around us and their ability to improvise another kind of society. 
and she discovers how deeply most of us desire connection, participation, altruism, and purposefulness. Ten teams demands confidence that that abundance awaits you if you will but if you will but awaken it, call upon it. It also requires that we suspend the instinct to focus on just a few problems. I wish we could focus, but we cannot repeal the laws of nature. And in the pursuit of human health, nature's driver diagram is a little more complicated than we would wish, and so must ours be. Uh, just as we act when it is three minutes to brain death, we show up when and where we're needed, in time, and the time is now. And luckily, most of us desire connection, participation, altruism, and purposefulness. I believe, especially, by the way, in the abundant energy of the youth among us. Many young people today believe that we are in a period of existential emergency, and they will help. All you need to do is to ask. And if you still feel overwhelmed, if you think that this ask from me is just unrealistic, too big a stretch, out of touch, please think then of how overwhelmed are those who need our help. The disasters in their lives are slower than earthquakes and fires, They're much slower than a cardiac arrest, but they are no less cruel and ultimately they are no less lethal. How overwhelmed must be the prisoner, repentant, but with little hope for the supports that will allow him to return ever whole to civic life with a home, a job, a loving community. How overwhelmed must be the refugee from climate catastrophe or a failed state or political oppression who is stuck at a border, peering at unimaginable wealth, but with little hope of finding a stable home or a place of identity or even good food or clean water. How Overwhelmed must be the single mother at the brink of homelessness with little hope of the daycare or respite, safety, and the income to get back on her feet to keep her, her child well. Or the worker, uninsured, bankrupted by the cost of illness. Or the elder, once proud, once young, hopeful at the dawn of a new job or a new love, now day after day after day alone and trapped by poverty and frailty. They know what overwhelmed really means. Now, I know I'm asking a lot. Friends of mine who've reviewed this speech have cautioned me. Uh, they may think you've gone off the deep end, Don. Is this realistic? I really don't know. But it better be realistic. We better make it realistic. I hear nature reciting her laws loudly now. Human health is under siege today and not at all just from the pandemic, and it is going to get far, far worse unless we address the causes. Unless we address the causes, more and more people are gonna get left out. Climate change, comical concentrations of wealth, they are here and they are hurting. Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Healthcare has immense power, confiscatory power, and with that power comes great responsibility to change the way we think, to change the way we act, to change the way we invest in human well-being. Thank you. I hope you're going to be interested in becoming part of what I'll call a 10 teams movement. And if you're interested in becoming part of such a movement, or even frankly, just starting with one or two teams, we at IHI invite you to register your plans with us. On your screen is where you can record your intentions now or in the weeks ahead. Let us know what you intend to do or are starting to do. And if enough of you join in and register, then IHI can help forge linkages among you to get and give support to each other and to share lessons, the lessons you're going to be learning from engaging where we now need to be engaged.